open burning in Malaysia banned due to haze. Customs cripple five attempts to smuggle contraband cigarettes. Good evening, welcome to News on 2. I'm Jessica Lee. The Department of Environment, or DOE, has imposed a ban on open burning in the whole country, except for cremation, religious purposes, grilling or barbecue, and flaring until the end of the southwest monsoon period. DOE Director General Norli Jaffa issued the order in view of the haze that has enveloped the country since the 5th of September. Now, the southwest monsoon prevails from May to September. Commenting further in a statement released today, Norlin said the ban has been imposed in accordance with the powers vested with the Director General of Environmental Quality as per Section 29AA, Subsection 2 of the Environmental Quality Act 1974. She also said that all quarters are advised against conducting open burning or allowing their land or premises to be encroached by irresponsible people who resort to open burning intentionally or unintentionally. Norlin said offenders can be fined up to 500,000 ringgit or sentenced to a jail term of up to five years or both. A maximum compound fine of 2,000 ringgit can also be imposed for every offence. Norlin advised the people to help extinguish small fires and report any open burning to the DOE as well as the Fire and Rescue Department. They can contact the DOE at 03-8889-1972 or 1-800-88-2727 and the Fire and Rescue Department at 999 to report open burning. The three locations in Johor are still battling forest fires involving Mua, Pontian and Galangpata in Iskandar Putri. However, Johor Fire and Rescue Department Director Datuk Yahya Madi said the fire in all of these locations are still under control. Di Muar tu lebih kurang dalam 20 hektar, 20 hektar tapi kita dah padam lebih 60%. Yang di Puntian pun lebih kurang 30 hektar pun dah dipadam dengan dah 70% padam. Yang di Lampatah sebenarnya kita dah tamatkan dari ada sedikit-sedikit lagi yang ditangani oleh Balai Bumbu Sekadar Puteri sendiri. He also advised members of the public to not engage in open burning as the hot weather could cause fire outbreaks. He said this after attending the department's corruption-free pledge ceremony. The Perak State Government is repairing six collapsed slopes along Jalan Simpang Pulai Cameron Highlands to avoid any untoward incident in these areas. State Public Amenities, Infrastructure, Agriculture and Plantations Committee Chairman Abdul Yunus Jamhari said the repairs are being done by Pintas Utama Sundar Berhad or PUSB at a cost of 5.4 million ringgit. In a statement today, he said the project is expected to be completed at the end of this year. He explained the state government was aware of public concerns over the collapsed slopes at several places along the road. At the moment, the Public Works Department has taken steps to prevent untoward incidents and the public is advised to exercise caution, especially at night. The Royal Malaysian Customs Department Central Zone successfully crippled five attempts to smuggle contraband cigarettes at the Kuala Lumpur International Airport or KLIA involving 8,840,000 sticks or 442,000 packets worth around 6.78 million ringgit. According to Central Zone Customs Assistant Director General Datuk Zulkarnain Muhammad Yusof, the attempts were made on the 6th of August, 14th of August, 3rd September and two cases yesterday which involved flights from Singapore and Vientiane, Laos. He said all five attempts had used the same modus operandi which is the adoption of fake airway bills for handling, dispatching and delivering shipments. Preliminary investigation revealed that the importers and addresses in the five cases were non-existent. 
The cigarettes have since been confiscated by customs for failure to prove any tax stamp approved by the director of the customs department. Speaking at a media conference in Sepang today, Dr. Zukunang say they are still investigating if there are links between the five cases. Section 135, subsection 1A of the Customs Act 1967 states that whoever is concerned in importing or exporting any uncustom goods or any prohibited goods contrary to such prohibition, whether such un Customed or prohibited goods be shipped, unshipped, delivered or not, shall be guilty of an offence and can be sentenced under Section 135, Subsection 1V of the same Act. Now, a couple suspected to be involved in the murder of a two-year-old girl have been remanded for seven days beginning today. The victim was believed to be physically and sexually tortured. Ayakaro Magistrates Court Deputy Registrar Mohamed Anwar Ostadi ordered the remand for the couple aged 45 and 36 until 17th of September. Elaborating further, Malacca Criminal Investigation Department CID Chief ACP Mohamed Noor Yazid Idris said the remand order was issued to facilitate investigations under Section 31, Subsection 1 of the Children's Act 2001 and Section 14, Subsection A of the Sexual Offences Against Children's Act 2017. The victim, who was believed to have been living with the suspect since end of July, was pronounced dead after she was brought to the hospital Malacca Emergency Department around 2 a.m. yesterday. Medical officers tried their level best to resuscitate the victim, but to no avail. They also found bruises on the victim's body parts before lodging a police report. A lower Sharia court judge in Ipoh has been remanded for five days in connection with an alleged bribery case. The 37-year-old was arrested by Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission or MACC officers at an eatery in Desa Chumur at 11.30 p.m. yesterday. It is alleged that he had received 4,000 ringgit from a police inspector to settle a Kalwat case. Also arrested by MACC officers in connection with the case was a 30-year-old Lance Corporal for allegedly abetting the judge. The Lance Corporal was arrested at 1.45 a.m. at the Bukit Mera police station. The remand order until 15th of September for both accused was issued by Lower Court Assistant Registrar N. Magiswari. The judge was represented by Counsel Dayang Nor Emilia as while the policeman was represented by Vivian Mitchell Benedict. The Kuala Lumpur High Court today adjourned Dat Sri Najib Tun Razak's One Malaysia Development Berhada 1MDB trial as the former Prime Minister has conjunctivitis in both eyes. Justice Colin Lawrence Sakira allowed Dato Sri Najib's lead counsel, Tan Sri Mama Shafi Abdullah's application to postpone the trial on medical grounds, and it was also not objected by the prosecution team. Meanwhile, Senior Deputy Public Prosecutor Dr. Sri Gopal Sri Ram did not object to the application. Justice Sakira held that if Dr. Sri Najib obtained one-day medical leave, the proceedings would resume tomorrow. On the 14th of August, the accused corruption trial over 42 million ringgit from SRC International Syndrome Berhad has been adjourned as he has contracted infectious conjunctivitis. Today, the defence team was scheduled to continue with cross-examination of the former Premier's former special officer Dato Amhari Effendi Nazaruddin, 43, who was the eighth prosecution witness. Dato Sri Najib, 66, is facing four charges of abusing his position to corruptly obtain 2.3 billion ringgit of 1MDB funds and 21 counts of money laundering related to the money. Eight illegal immigrants, including a woman and a five-year-old Indonesian boy, were arrested by Region 2 Kukup Marine Police near Pulau Kukup, Pontian. The arrest was made possible after the Marine Police overtook a speedboat driven by a 30-year-old man at 11 last night. 
Marine Police Region 2 Deputy Commander Superintendent Noor Azman Jamal said the speedboat that looked suspicious was believed to be heading for Indonesia. After inspection, the police team found the illegal immigrants trying to leave the country without proper documentation. All of them were brought back to Region 2 Marine Police Jetty along with the speedboat. The case is being investigated under the Anti-Trafficking in Persons and Anti-Smuggling of Migrants Act 2007 and the Immigration Act 1963. National Chief Scout Dan Sri Shafi Mohamed Saleh has passed away. He was 73. National Scout Assistant Chief Commissioner Ahmad Sabri Saad said Dan Sri Shafi died at 9.30 a.m. earlier today due to abdominal complications at the Salayan Hospital in Slangor. Dan Sri Shafi, who was a former Minister of Higher Education, leaves behind wife, Puan Sri Professor Emeritus Dr. Mizan Adila Ibrahim and three children. His remains were later buried in Kampung Ginching, selecting his Sepang Selangor after Zohor prayers. The National Chief Scout had also served as the head of the Research Centre at the National Institute of Public Administration or Intern for five years. He had also served as an Under Secretary in the Human Resource Ministry and as Secretary of Research in the Policy Analysis Section of the Malaysian Centre for Development Studies in the Prime Minister's Department. Coming up after the break, Life Med to monitor patients' health remotely. Welcome back. Malaysia is willing to share its knowledge on digital economy with any country. Ministry of Communications and Multimedia Secretary General Datuk Suryani Ahmad is confident that this sharing of knowledge will not only benefit Malaysia but also inspire other countries to be equipped with knowledge on digital economy. The sharing of communication and information is in line with UNESCO's Information for All program, IFAP, in which member and partner governments pledge to harness the new opportunities of the information age to create equitable societies through better access to information. Benda ni, uh boleh kita kongsi bersama-sama dengan negara lain sebab tidak semua negara mempunyai penekanan uh, digital ekonomi sebagaimana yang Malaysia buat. Dan ini juga adalah penting untuk kita sama-sama berkongsi dengan negara lain supaya negara lain mungkin boleh mencontohi uh, apa yang kita ada di Malaysia. Datuk Suryani said this after officiating a meeting on Information for Development Working Group in the federal capital today. Meanwhile, UNESCO IFAP Chair Dorothy Gordon said the policy provided by the Malaysian government in the aspect of digital economy will help in improving the quality of life of the people. I think that Malaysia has inspired many countries in terms of policy because you actually got a lot of excellent policies in this area and uh, we are hoping that there can be more information sharing from Malaysia to other countries so that other countries can continue to learn from you. The Malay Economic Action Council, or M10, has requested that the Finance Ministry, or MOF, reconsider its recent decision to drop 33 Bumiputra Furniture Companies from the Centralised Contract Panel, or KPB, list. In a statement, the M10 said the move was seen as being unfair to the concerned companies under the patronage of the Malaysian Bumiputra Furniture Industry Association, or PETRA. A total of 33 companies, or 38% of the 87 listed to supply furniture to government agencies, were dropped effective 15th of July. The axing was a result of the companies not having obtained the Product Certification Services, or PCS, from the Forest Research Institute, Malaysia, or FRIM, FRIM, within the stipulated period. According to the association, the decision was unfair as the period for testing as well as time to obtain the PCS was beyond the control of the companies which had followed all the process and time frames set by FRIM. It also said the companies dropped had their own furniture manufacturing factories and had been in operation for more than 20 years with wide experience and recognition but still failed to receive the PCS before the set date.
Joe Corporation or Jacobs Unit, a new wave health syndrome Berhad, has launched a digital patient care solution, LifeMed, where patient health could be monitored remotely. Jacob President and Chief Executive Officer Dato Kamo Zaman Abu Qasim said New Wave Health is a joint venture between Jacob's subsidiary and two W Corporations in Berhad with United Kingdom based digital healthcare service provider Smart Med Global Limited. Speaking to the media after the document exchange ceremony for the strategic partnership between N2W and Smart Met today, Dato Kamaruzaman said the amount of capital for the joint venture was 20 million ringgit, with 60% from N2W and 40% from Smart Met. Uh, NOU is uh, uh, a set of agreements signed between N2W and Smart Med Global, forming a joint venture company. Uh, 60-40. Uh, 60 is my uh, NW uh, and 40% uh, uh, smart man. Uh, this joint venture company will then spearhead it to the, uh, the one to spearhead to uh, the business. LifeMed integrated three components, namely Bluetooth to enable portable medical devices in measuring blood pressure and blood glucose, LifeMed app, the mobile application that records and capture readings, and LifeMed cloud portal and analytics facilities. The LifeMed solution is supported by a 24-hour one-stop call center and is able to alert doctors using red, amber or green flags. Dato Kamaruzaman said for the initial two years, LifeMed would be introduced in 26 hospitals nationwide under Jacob's healthcare arm, KPJ Healthcare Berhad. First defeat for Malaysia in World Cup qualifiers. Stay with us. Now, Spirit of Malaysia lost to the United Arab Emirates, or UAE, 1-2 in Group G of the 2022 FIFA World Cup qualifiers at the Bukit Jalil National Stadium last night. Playing at home, Harimau Malaya surprised favourites UAE with a perfect start as Shafiq Ahmad headed in across from Matthew Davis just 30 seconds into the match to hand the home side an early lead. However, the visitors still have more than enough time on hand to turn things around when striker Ali Ahmed Magwood scored an equaliser in the 43rd minute. In the second half, Ali completed UAE's comeback as he was poorly marked by the Malaysian defence to score the winning goal in the 75th minute. Malaysia is now in third position in Group G after two games behind UAE and leaders Thailand. The national squad will face Vietnam at the Mighty National Stadium in Hanoi on the 10th of October. Head coach Tan Ching Ho, who was hoping for at least a draw against the world number 65 side, was naturally upset with the outcome. Only that we cannot contain the, the keep the same tempo, same intensity. Of course, uh, for the first half, especially first 20 minutes, uh, we should be getting more goals. So that's why the, the quality we have, uh, I think we have two chances, they, 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 they converted the two goals. Cheng Ho said his charges, ranked 159th in the world, needed to prepare harder for the upcoming matches, especially in the next match against Vietnam at the Mighty National Stadium in Hanoi on the 10th of October. Meanwhile, UAE head coach Bert Van Marik said the match was the best time to test his young players. You, you only can um, learn young players to play on this level by let them, letting them play. And uh, it's always difficult because you, at the same time, um, the result is, is, is uh, very, very important. UAE will next host Indonesia at the Al Maktoum Stadium, Dubai, on the 10th of October.
Meanwhile, in another Group G match, Thailand got their first win of the 2022 FIFA World Cup qualifiers in style with a 3-0 win over Indonesia in Jakarta on Tuesday. All the goals came in the second half with Super Chuck Sarachat finding the back of the net in the 55th minute. He struck again in the 73rd minute for his second goal of the evening. Teraton Bunmathan gave Thailand's third from the spot on 65 minutes to complete a 3 0 win. The win was Akira Nishino's first competitive win as head coach of the War Elephants, and they are now on four points from two matches in Group G. The Thais will face the United Arab Emirates next on 15th of October, while the Indonesians, who have now lost two matches in a row, will face Emiratis away on the 11th of October. And that's it from us this evening in our top story, open burning in Malaysia banned due to haze. Join me again at 12.30 tomorrow afternoon. I'm Jessica Lee. Thank you for watching.